Have you ever felt hidden, smothered by what I'll call the uns? Unseen, unappreciated, underestimated. Has it ever seemed like something or someone pressed the pause button on your potential and dreams? Jesus understands what it's like to be hidden. His first 30 years were mostly undocumented and uncelebrated, but with his life and with ours, we dare not mistake unseen for unimportant or unapplauded for unproductive. Join me as we discover the strength God grows in anonymous seasons. Has following God ever led you into difficult times? If so, I've got great news. You're in really, and I do mean really, good company. Earlier in this series, we studied Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River, which concluded with Father God's heavenly shout recorded in Matthew 3, 17. This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. In the very next verse, Matthew 4, 1, we read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. At the waters of the Jordan, the sky ripped open, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and rested upon Jesus. God thundered His unfailing love from the heavens, and then He sent His beloved Son into the desert? What? I love you, Son. Enjoy the desert? Generally speaking, this sequence of events makes us a little uncomfortable. Can following God's good spirit lead us straight into a desert? Can perfect obedience deposit us in a wasteland? Can God's loving will call us to barren places? Evidently. Based on Jesus' example, the answer to all of the above seems to be yes. It's just something we don't talk about that often. We prefer it when following God leads us into green pastures and quiet waters and spas. It seems that God's good spirit would lead us to good places like success and strength, happiness and wealth. God led me into the desert, hallelujah, is just not the stuff t-shirts are made of, but it does seem to be the stuff that world changers are made of. After 30 years of hiddenness in Nazareth, Jesus offered no resistance when the Holy Spirit directed him into yet another type of desert. Matthew simply states that Jesus was led there. Desert is translated from the Greek eremos, which speaks of the abandonment of a person, cause, or place. Though it can refer to an arid tract of land, or waterless region, the primary meaning of Eremos, especially when used to describe a place, is that of solitude or emptiness. In this sense, desert is a descriptor for lonely places and uninhabited regions. Geographically for Jesus, desert probably referenced the untamed wilderness just west of the Jordan River that to this day features wave upon wave of dry, brown, barren hills where few things grow and fewer people pass. Mark adds two more details to our image of Jesus in the desert. In Mark 1.13 we read that he was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Personally, I find the wild animals somewhat alarming, but the mention of angels is much more promising and was no doubt a source of great comfort to Jesus. However, another presence was also in that desert whose agenda was anything but comfort. Satan, he seems to find his way into most deserts. Satan's disagreeable company in the Judean wilderness appears to have been permitted by Father God himself. In His love, the Father led the Son into a place that was a desert by every imaginable definition. Physically, it was barren. Emotionally, it was lonely. And spiritually, it was troubled. And though we have no record of God's voice sounding in the desert as it did at the Jordan, we do know that Satan's voice was quite clear. 
However, the Judean desert wasn't chapter one of Jesus' life. It was chapter 30. The Father didn't deposit the Son on the earth as a grown man. Emmanuel, God incarnate, came to us as an infant. For three mostly unseen, unapplauded decades, Jesus made countless unseen, unapplauded choices. Year after year, those choices clustered and gained momentum and now shaped the earth-shaking decisions Jesus faced during what was destined to become one of the most well-known experiences in all of history, the temptation of Christ. Jesus' water baptism marked his first step out of hiddenness into documented, debated, scrutinized, and celebrated history. His second step took him from the cool waters of the Jordan into the dry wilderness of Judea, as Matthew 4.1 states, to be tempted by the devil. Biblical language scholars tell us that the Greek word for tempted can mean to examine or test, to learn another's true nature or character, or to try to trap or attempt to catch in a mistake. When it appears as a noun, this same word is rendered temptation, testing, or trial, and is often used to describe the unglamorous realities of walking in faith when following God seems to lead us into deserts. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If taken seriously, these admonitions from James and Peter will challenge us to the core. They call us to rejoice when we, like Jesus, experience testing times. These early church fathers instruct us to anticipate trials, persevere through them, and rest assured in them that we're somehow participating in Jesus' sufferings. But in the middle of a desert, James and Peter's words can be easy on the eyes and hard on the heart because trials are, by definition, trying. Trials reduce us. And that process of reduction can be exhausting emotionally, physically, and spiritually. When obedience leads us into deserts, when we're pressed by trying, testing, tempting times, we can strengthen our resolve by remembering that trials and temptations aren't our greatest foes. Eternally, perhaps the greater danger on this earth is losing perspective and beginning to value our fragile surroundings more than God's faithful friendship in our lives. If God's presence truly is our treasure in this life, and if that presence had led us, as it did Jesus, into trying places, is there really anywhere else on earth that we'd rather be? For the love of his Father's close companionship, Jesus followed God's Spirit straight into the Judean wilderness. And in that trying, tempting, testing space, Jesus had choices to make, just as we do as we read in Hebrews 2, 18 and 4, 15. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Throughout the New Testament, the writers who were inspired by God's Spirit to write about Jesus' wilderness experience asserted in unison that Jesus was tempted. So I find it reasonable to conclude that Jesus was temptable. 
in the desert. Jesus was tried by Satan. His faith was tested. His soul was tempted. In fact, as we just heard from Hebrews, Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are. When we study Jesus' life, it becomes clear that it is possible for God's good spirit to lead us into deserts, for obedience to deposit us in seemingly barren spaces, in seasons in which we feel tested, tempted, and tried. But thanks be to God, because Jesus himself suffered through tempting, testing times. He is well able to wisely mentor us with great compassion through every trial and temptation we will ever face in this life. That reality makes Jesus' wilderness experience a worthy focus of our attention. We'll continue that study in just a few minutes. People always ask us, like, how did you guys' church grow here in Long Beach? How were you able to reach this community? How are you guys such a diverse and multi-ethnic church? Like, we, we didn't start two, three years ago. We've been, we planted 12 years ago. We've been here in Long Beach for over 10 years. And nobody knew what we were doing. Hi, my name is Noemi Chavez, and my husband and I are pastors here at 7th Street Church in the city of Long Beach in California. In my college years, I feel like that was definitely a hidden season for me. I was a, a local youth pastor at a little church in East LA, and I was serving the kids in that community. And I, I never knew that I was gonna pastor a church or church plant. But in those seasons when you're hidden, you allow God to just shape your heart, your life, so that you're not reacting to life, but you're actually allowing the Spirit of God to lead you to make decisions through the hard things. I leaned in fully into the right now. I am hands-on church planter with my husband, and we're gonna build God's house in, in Long Beach. I've been pastoring already for about six, almost seven years when we began the conversations of um, what can we do preventatively as a church to help girls before they end up being trafficked on the streets? How can we partner with local authority? So that season was a season of of a lot of toiling, it was work. I was hanging out with one of my girlfriends and she told me, don't you just long to travel and get to speak all over the place and all over the world and just, and I remember I told her there wasn't space in my life for me to travel and be all over the place. I needed to nurture and build what God had trusted us in that season. And so my answer to her was, you know what? God knows where to find me. He knows where to find me. My shelf life is not based on my personal goals and dreams, right? God knows the time when he needs me in another place and space. The book actually just helped me feel like it's okay not to be pushing and struggling to reach the next thing. Like she talks about main course and like the appetizers and the dessert part of a meal. And so many times we see a season in our life as like this is just the first part of the meal. Like I'm looking forward to the main course. I really felt like this season this is my main course right now. Like this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. It's no less than what's coming. And so all of a sudden, this thing that was a hidden season where we were just working and organically finding ways to serve the girls in our community, it's like God says, okay, now how about you train other churches to do this? And it, it was never the plan, but God's plan is always so much better and God was getting ready to launches into a new season where we're going to impact the lives of young girls throughout this nation and even globally. Hidden seasons are gonna be a continual cycle in our lives and they keep us grounded and they keep us close to Jesus and they remind us at the end of the day that He is our source. That we really can't do this if He is not the one sustaining us. That we really can't do this if, if we're not walking out our faith and remembering that it is the private and the quiet and the unseen places that are most significant in our walk with Christ. At the end of the day, God knows where to find me. Have you ever felt hidden or overlooked? Your potential unseen? 
and your abilities unappreciated? Jesus knew that season well. The first three decades of his life were unrecognized by the public eye and uncelebrated by those who knew him best. In Dr. Alicia Sholey's book, Anonymous, you will discover how to overcome the temptation that tries to steal your destiny. Embrace the beauty of hidden seasons and live a life of power and purpose. Today, for your gift of $40 or more to the many outreaches of TBN, you will receive the book, Anonymous, and the companion study guide, so you can discover, as so many others have, that hidden from the eyes and accolades of man is where God does some of his greatest work. Go online or call now. Jesus was immersed in the waters of the Jordan for only a few seconds. His immersion in the temptation, however, would last much, much longer. Obedience to Father God led Jesus to remain in the Judean desert more than 40 days, as we read in Matthew 4, 1 through 2. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I invite you to think of these 40 days as a window that opens into Jesus' present, his future, and his past. Into his present because the temptation was real. It wasn't hypothetical. It wasn't allegorical. For Jesus, it was actual. He lived it. Into his future because in it we see hints of, foreshadowing of, the challenges he would face as he journeyed crossward. And the 40 days additionally open a window into Jesus' past, into his hidden years. Because for Jesus and for us, the choices we make in the place of trials today are greatly influenced by the choices we've made in our yesterdays. Today never exists in a vacuum. Every documented choice Jesus made in the temptation reflected undocumented choices he was making before the temptation. In hidden years, the Father was preparing the Son to overcome three critical areas of temptation. In Matthew's account, the first interaction in Jesus' temptation physically took place near some stones in the desert, the second at the tip of the temple, and the third on a very high mountain. Spiritually, though, these exchanges had nothing to do with the environment, religious landmarks, or random rocks. Innumerable lessons could be mined from this biblical account. I invite you to think of Jesus' experience in the Judean wilderness as one singular temptation with three layers, all of which we'll study in detail in the episodes to come. A layer of appetite, tell these stones to become bread. A layer of applause, throw yourself down from the temple. And a layer of authority, all this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. In every one of these layers, Satan used the same four-part strategy to tempt Jesus in the wilderness that he still uses to tempt us today. First, he dangled a lure in front of Jesus by offering him something attractive. Second, he appealed to a natural longing in Jesus by appealing to normal, neutral human desires. Third, he identified a means to satisfying that natural longing by suggesting how Jesus can get what he wants. And fourth, he sounded a tempting invitation to sin by masterfully mixing truth with his lies. Jesus' strategy in resisting temptation also followed a clear two-part pattern. In every layer, Jesus first anchored himself by looking to Father God and his word. Then secondly, Jesus made a definitive choice that rendered each layer's invitation ineffective. One of the discoveries fascinated me in this study. It was that Satan's basic methodology hasn't changed since Jesus' day in the Judean wilderness, or for that matter, Adam and Eve's stay in the Garden of Eden. 
the same tempting invitations have sounded throughout centuries and still loudly command our attention today. There's new packaging for sure, but every one of Satan's shiny, modernized packages contains the same tried and tired tune. Thankfully, the power of Jesus' choices have also not changed. His decisions and the process by which He made them can guide all of us safely through every tempting trial on this earth. Here are two truths that I hope you can take home from today's study of Anonymous. Number one, obedience sometimes leads us into deserts. And number two, today's choices shape tomorrow's decisions. In unseen, unapplauded spaces, we all are making unseen, unapplauded choices. And those choices cluster and gather momentum and profoundly influence the decisions we will make in trials and temptations. The reason I emphasize viewing Jesus' wilderness experience as one temptation with three layers is because we tend to isolate temptations and miss seeing how interconnected they are in the enemy's strategies against us. Each layer in Jesus' temptation was connected, consecutive, and cumulative. Let me illustrate. Think of Jesus' temptation as one house with three stories. Our home only has two stories, but it'll suffice as an illustration. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, fixer-upper. Well, my husband and I purchased sort of a second cousin to a fixer-upper. I called it a gutter-outer. The house was a mess. But my incredible husband, who naturally sees potential in all people and all things, said, it's got a solid foundation for us to build on, babe. So we bought the house. And in a few years, my husband, Barry, started drawing up plans to gut the first story and add a second story to our humble abode. During that process, Barry started spending a lot of time under the house. While well, being a writer and not a builder, I immediately thought of the connection between that crawl space and our hidden years. Have you noticed that no one asks for a tour of our crawl spaces? but everything in our home is dependent upon what's under our home. Because Barry attended so carefully to what was unseen and uncelebrated, we were able to build what would be visible without fear that its cumulative weight would cause the whole structure to collapse. In the same way, people generally don't stand in line for a tour of our hidden years, do they? which can be rather disheartening if we're in the habit of determining the value of our life seasons by ticket sales. But just like that crawl space, our hidden years house the unglamorous guts of a truly fruitful existence. There, in the underestimated and uncelebrated spaces of life, God builds within us a sturdy support system for our souls. If we don't respect God's craftsmanship in unapplauded seasons, all that is applauded in our lives will rest on a fragile foundation and eventually, through the added weight the visible brings, will be in danger of collapse. Think of Jesus' life. There's a hidden foundation, 30 years of relative anonymity, three mostly undocumented, uncelebrated, underestimated decades, then Jesus steps out of anonymity and is tested in three layers of the temptation. A layer of appetite, a layer of applause, a layer of authority. But Jesus' hidden years had forged a trustworthy foundation. Month after month after month, He resisted rushing and took the time to live those years well. Now, as Jesus entered the Judean wilderness, each layer of the temptation would rest on the one before it, like a second floor does on a first floor, and double or triple the full weight bearing down on Jesus' hidden foundation. 
if there had been any cracks in that foundation, the compounded stress of appetite, applause, and authority would have revealed and exploited them. But since his hidden foundation was sound, all the temptations in the world could not crush him. And the same can be true for us. If we honor what God grows in us in hidden seasons, we won't be seduced by what man offers to us in visible seasons, which returns us to a respect for the mighty power of seemingly small choices. Every choice we make is an investment in a future we cannot see. As the clock keeps ticking, the stresses of appetite, applause, and authority expose the state of our hearts and the stability of our souls. May the God of grace strengthen us by His Word, by His Spirit, and by His people to invest each tick well. Until next time. In a world consumed by becoming someone, going somewhere, and being known, it's time to stop, take a breath, and discover the beauty of being hidden. Through Dr. Alicia Sholey's book, Anonymous, you will discover the keys to walking in your identity, understanding your purpose, and living with intentionality. And you'll develop, as Jesus did, the strength necessary to withstand the trials and tests that so often come with the spotlight. I think that what Alicia has done with the book Anonymous and the work that she continues to do is really transforming lives. I see so many people that want to live a deep, authentic, not a striving, performance, chasing, um, hustling for love kind of life. I feel like that's where Anonymous kind of intersected my life. The book Anonymous is an unbelievable book. I mean, Alicia, great writer. She made the statement that 90% of Jesus' life was anonymous and no one knew that he existed. Reading these words, like it just leapt off the page and really transformed my life. Today, for your gift of $40 or more in support of the many outreaches of TVN, we want to send you your very own book, Anonymous, along with the companion study guide, Discover Purpose in the Hidden Seasons. Call or go online to receive yours today.